sorry. Okay, we are going to call the March 21st, 2018 Planning Commission meeting to order. Um, Mario, would you like to do the Pledge of Allegiance? And may we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Fonda Bernardi? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Lambert? Here. Commissioner Perry? Here. Chair Fresco? Here. Uh, director's report, please. Good evening, Commission. For your April meetings, um, starting on April 4th, um, 1650 Lincoln, which is a um, development review permit that you saw couple months ago um, so they made some design changes they're coming back to the Commission also that night we will have uh, mobility and parking discussion then on April 18th uh, a modification to the uh, 3008 Santa Monica Boulevard mixed-use project which is currently under construction so they're looking to modify one of their conditions um, also zoning ordinance bucket 2b um, and then Civic Center specific plan amendment for the sports field and then also a um, a review of the 17th Street cycle track, which is a, a project on 17th from Santa Monica College to Wilshire. So we want to show you that. And then on um, in for the May meeting, starting on May 2nd, um, the formal hearings for the land use, um, or the, excuse me, the the local coastal plan, is that? Yeah, LUP, yeah, right. Uh, so that's tentative, and then also an appeal for 470 19th Street and then on May 16th um, tentatively the um, float up for the uh, hotel at Santa Monica and Ocean so the 101 Santa Monica DA and then coming up at City Council on March 27th is the appeal um, for 2309 Lincoln and then also that night um, DA monitoring and the extension of the R1 IZO um, and regarding the R1 IZO um, at uh, as directed by council we sent out postcards to all R1 owners and uh, looks like about 6600 went out on Monday so everyone should be informed so I just want to confirm some of these like don't think those are all happening on March 27th no, that's so. going on yes. yeah yes that, that is going on okay that's right so yeah so um, yeah, for March 27th, the council is the DA monitoring, no, I'm sorry, the extension for the R1, and then the appeal is going yeah. April 24th, and DA monitoring is April 10th. I didn't have those dates quite right. So that's April it. 20th? April 24th. 24th. For the appeal? Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, I haven't looked at the council agenda for the 27th. Um, my understanding is that the only action item on that item on the R1 is whether to extend the ICO is right. not to change the language of the ICO. That's correct. correct. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. There's a question. Yeah, could you restate the date for the uh, DA at Santa Monica Boulevard and Ocean Avenue? Yeah, that's May 16th. I don't see any other questions. Uh, our next item is our planning commissioner announcements. I was going to take this moment to give you all a quick rundown of our fabulous retreat that we had last weekend. We're all deeply in love from the bonding that we experienced. <laughs> um, and we're all going to be using our request to speak buttons. Um, so nobody has to be waving to catch the chair's eye anymore. Um, we decided that we are going to attempt to update our mission statement and we're going to have to put that on our next agenda and 
hopefully staff, when that agenda item comes, will be able to tell us how one updates a mission statement as well. And maybe we'll appoint a subcommittee to work on the project. So we'll scope all that out. Um, we had a discussion of educational topics, which was really interesting. And lots of the commission, I mean, the, all the commissioners had many topics that were really interesting that reflected their personal interests and our shared interests. Many topics from self-driving cars to defining what lowering density actually means for HAAs and uh, health and well-being, equity issues, all the things we all care about. Uh, we talked about uh, how we would like to interface with other commissions and uh, we uh, wanted to uh, make sure that the Planning Commission is more aware, maybe it would be on us if we receive agendas in our inboxes better, uh, but more aware of what other commissions are doing and to encourage other commissions to send people to us when we're, we're talking about things that are of interest to them and so we can all communicate together and be at one. Uh, and then we were looking at uh, past projects and from when they were seen by the Planning Commission to how they turned out at the end and talked about different things we would like to hear more about in terms of our past activities so we can make sure we do things even better in the future. Uh, we had a fascinating discussion on various legal questions having to do with legal standards of review, the purpose of findings, how to, what findings need to be based on. I won't dare risk screwing that up by summarizing any of that. Um, and uh, we talked about having lots of sort of standard information items coming to us about uh, um, forwarded newsletters on housing issues that staff receives, forwarding uh, information on upcoming lectures on planning topics that we might want to participate in or attend, um, and various things like that. So it was a really interesting meeting, and I thought it went very well. Jason Perry, please. Yeah, I, I received my first uh, zoning administrator agenda, and I want to thank staff for getting on that right away. Thanks. I received two of them. All right. <laughs> um, I think that was just one I successfully signed up for myself, too. Um, so uh, our next item is a consent calendar. We have two sets of minutes on there and, uh, a, and a STOA. Um, I actually have a note on one of the minutes which I submitted to staff, it's tiny. Um, that is 6B. Um, so I'll just run that through so y'all know what it is. Um, on page seven, uh, with my disclosures, uh, some of the subtleties were lost in the translation. Uh, it said that I met with the project architecture on August 21st, 2017 regarding the home's architecture. It was regarding the home's restoration as a landmark. We were really talking about it from that point of view. And then in the end of that paragraph, it says that for approximately 10 years through the Santa Monica Conservancy, uh, I actually only served with Ms. Kaplan on the Landmarks Commission and I served with David Kaplan on the board of the Santa Monica Conservancy. So I wanted to clarify that I actually serve with both of them in various ways. <laughs> uh, so with those changes, does anybody have anything else to say or a motion? And we're talking about two uh, uh, minutes and a STOA. I move approval of the, uh, the two sets of minutes and the STOA for 2929 Pico Boulevard. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Beautiful. Uh, so that brings us to, uh, oh, do we need to do, I should just say, is anyone opposed? Are there any abstentions? I just want to clarify that we really do have four full votes. Okay. Uh, so that brings us to our study session. Uh, which is of the draft local coastal program land use plan. And we have staff Liz Barrell to uh, fill us in on the details. 
on? Oh. All right. Good evening. Um, my name is Liz Barl. I'm a senior planner here at the City of Santa Monica. Is this, um, okay. Is that better? There's a lot of feedback. Okay. So, um, good evening. Um, really happy to be here this um, evening at the study session and um, to talk to you about the draft local coastal plan and I want to welcome everybody who's come this evening to hear about the coastal plan. Um, it's great to have people who are interested in our coastal planning so thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm going to start by just explaining the, the basics of what is the local coastal program um, and the land use plan. So the, the planning for this process is all based on the requirements of the California Coastal Act. So that was in 1976 when the state um, passed this law that said that all local governments along the coast would have to do a local coastal program and um, with, with um, requirements for the protection of the coastal, re of coastal resources for the access enjoyment of all people in the public. So it's a very grand and lofty um, uh, state act that was really focused on um, degradation of the coastline and turning that around and making sure that this coastline was protected for everybody. So I think the city of Santa Monica voters at the time before the, the Coastal Act was approved, there was a proposition that preceded it and city of Santa Monica voters were very favorable um, towards the Coastal Act. So on the big picture, the Coastal Act is something that is um, very important for the state of California. But we're going to talk about um, our specific situation here in Santa Monica and what it is that um, we need to do with our LCP. So the Coastal Commission needs to certify both the land use plan, this is what we're working on now, and the implementation plan in order for the authority to issue coastal development permits to transfer over to the city. So in the meantime, in the absence of a certified LCP, um, those CDPs are approved by the Coastal Commission, which means that currently the, um, uh, any project, any development that goes on in this coastal zone goes through all the city processes, gets city permits, and then goes over to the Coastal Commission and gets their permits. And sometimes that can be problematic. So our current project, as I said, is just the LUP. When this gets adopted, hopefully will be adopted by the council and we will send it over to the Coastal Commission. Should it be certified, we will be halfway there and then the IP process will be started. So our project timeline, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. In uh, 2016, we came to the Planning Commission the first time and um, talked about this process in a general way and what we were going to be doing. We had a, a lot of initial outreach to all sorts of commissions and we had public outreach and it's all described in, in the draft. Um, and then the draft was released at the beginning of this year. In the last couple of months, we have been going to, um, forward. We have been going to presentations to a lot of boards and commissions, recreation and parks, the task force on the environment, landmarks, the peer corporation board just earlier this week. And last week we held a uh, discussion, a sea level rise discussion um, with a panel of experts. It was really a great panel. Um, I think everyone learned a lot. I always learn more every time I listen to these these guys. So fortunately, it was uh, recorded. It's going to be put up on our website, we hope, by tomorrow evening. And, um, and that brings us to tonight. So big picture in general, what we're trying to do with our LCP, as I said, we're a little different from um, a lot of coastal locations, um, coastal jurisdictions. And we have a lot of access and a lot of uh, public beaches and it's you can even just see from this picture there are not many places along the California coast where an entire city's waterfront is this open. So we've had policies for years that have promoted access and um, um, recreate low-cost recreation, keeping the beach free, keeping the pier free, um, you know that kind of thing which is very compatible with the Coastal Act. And what we're trying to do in this LCP is 
preserve all of those policies that have got us to the situation where we are today and look into the future to continue to have um, a coastline that is easily accessed by all and protecting the water, protecting our uh, water quality through um, stormwater infiltration and, and other things, and, um, and also preserving the scenic views and resources, the, the unique resources that we have the, and views of them, and we'll get into all of that in our discussion. Also in this LCP, for the first time, we will be addressing sea level rise policies, and this is why we focused on that latest um, meeting that we held. So this slide is just the contents. In addition to the chapters of the LCC, the appendices have some interesting materials that are worth looking at. So the outreach I mentioned that we did in the first section is all talked about with um, really uh, great summaries of the information that we got from our pier and beach access survey and the owl on the pier, which was that visualization that we had out there of sea level rise that was out on the pier for a couple of months and other information. The peer design guidelines are incorporated, which is um, very good because the LUP becomes the standard of review and we want to make sure that the peer design guidelines are incorporated in, in, the, in review in the future for coastal permits. So these are our eight sub areas. This is also, by the way, in the attachment that you have. So if you want to refer to this, um, this attachment that was in the staff report, has um, this map with our eight sub areas. And with that, I'm going to talk about the, the seven areas of um, policy discussion, policy um, matters in the LUP, starting with access. So today, our current situation in our beach area, as I said, we have a lot of access. People come to the beach. They come by bus, by train, by car. We have millions and millions of visitors <coughs> every year. Um, there's all sorts of different numbers I keep hearing, but it's always in the millions every year. And um, we have bicycling. We have a lot of we have the bike path. We have a lot of ways to get to the beach on on um, recently developed bike paths. And of course, we try to prioritize walking and pedestrians. And there's our pedestrian plan and our bike action plan. And so that's our situation today. Along with all of that, we actually have a lot of parking. So we have about 5,800 parking spaces just on these beach lots. Um, if you look at the bottom um, image here, the bottom figure, um, all those little gray squares along the beach. So we have 5,800 parking spaces. We also have a lot of parking in the downtown area, which is back up for, and for the beach. And also people who want to go to the beach and to downtown can park one time. And that's something that we encourage. And then we have more parking in the Civic Center. So in addition to being a city that has, especially since the Expo has opened, we have more access through transit than most places. We also have more parking than most places. And this is both good and problematic because part of the balance that we want to achieve in our coastal area is a balance between environmental quality and access. And, you know, the more people driving to the beach, the congestion, it actually impacts people's experience when they sit in their car a long time to get to that parking, and it also res results in pollution. So that is um, you know, part of that balance that we're trying to address. Also, we have um, residential preferential parking. It's been a big issue with the Coastal Commission for a long time. They don't generally like it. They don't approve it in a lot of places. It has been approved in a lot of locations in um, Santa Monica, and this map shows those red lines are locations of existing approved residential preferential parking. So that map will just kind of establish that, that um, baseline, and it will be that the, um, the reference for future land use um, planning. So our approach, as I said, is just to incorporate what Santa Monica does, the Go SAMO policies, encouraging active transportation, encouraging transit, reducing driving dependence, and um, being consistent with the DCP, the CCSP, which have different kind of approaches to parking than the standard parking requirement model. So policy 21, I'm just going to pull out a couple of the um, key policies as we go through this. 
Um, and so in access, one of the most important ones is this one, which basically is the policy that says that additional automobile must be provided for new development, and the amount is what is dealt with in the implementation plan, like later on and in the, coast, in the zoning ordinance that we already have. So the exceptions are downtown, the community plan area, and that's based on the DCP. Um, additions to a single family home of less than 50%, and also the city, the, if, um, uh, if the project is a city designated historic resource or landmark, and um, this is to be consistent with, the with what we have now in our zoning code. And um, D is just if there's any other exemption. And then location on the pier. So this is something new, something we've been working on with the Coastal Commission staff that would require that, um, park it, that new development on the pier, rather than requiring parking, would requi be required to provide a TDM program. And there's some detail here about what that means, how much they would have to provide depending on how much is being added. But this is really in recognition of the fact that there is not a possibility to add parking for new development on the pier. We don't want to add parking along with adding new activity that comes to the pier. And we want the um, flexibility as the pier, as the council decides on what should happen in the pier in the future, that if there should be more activity, it can develop without this kind of burden of parking. And this replaces a very problematic um, requirement in the LUP today that talks about a number. The number is 471, and that's the number of parking spaces that used to be on the pier before the, um, the big storm knocked the pier out, and they said, well, you've got to replace that amount in some way or other, like either on the pier or on the beach or a combination, but it's always that number. And it's, it's uh, been there, it, it, it kind of puts a stranglehold on peer activity. So we've worked really hard with the Coastal Commission staff and they have agreed to this in the latest letter that we received from them, at which you received this morning. They were still good with this policy. So, oops. Sorry, move on, thank you. Okay, another, um, in, you know, also in regard to the peer, um, other policies that I wanted to point out under access is the our policies for the pier for maintaining for pedestrians, for multimodal, and that flexibility um, for dis for making future um, decisions on the pier. So we're we're not talking tonight about the pier bridge. That's a separate project, but um, the LUP will establish policies that the pier bridge would need. You know, should there be a decision about a pier bridge and should that be decided by the council, it would need to go for a CDP to the Coastal Commission and what we will have as the land use policies um, as a standard of review provide flexibility for whatever that decision is. If it's about having parking, not having parking, um, providing as long as parking is provided in general in the area, and that was in policy number 18. Um, in addition, bike racks are needed to be, um, are to be provided near the pier. And um, again, on, on the, as far as the pier goes, the Coastal Commission staff has agreed to this parking approach. So um, while that is good news, unfortunately, not all of the uh, discussions with the Coastal Commission, and we talked about this in the staff report, have, have gone as um, well as we had hoped. Um, at this point, we are still working um, to discuss the issue of the DCP's parking approach, which does not require parking for new development. Um, they have not um, expressed approval of that, and so that's going to be an ongoing discussion. Um, in addition, we've been having discussions with them about the idea of parking pricing. So as you know, the city manages parking through a whole bunch of different ways, and one of them is um, through pricing policies to make sure that um, our parking resources are utilized the best way possible. The Coastal Commission staff has taken the position that, that parking pricing is development, and if it's development, it needs a CDP. We disagree with that, and so again, this is a conversation that will 
continue um, through this process and possibly up to the point of the commission's consideration for certification. So moving on to recreation, the current situation in our coastal area is that we have a lot of recreation facilities. As I said before, um, there, are there are beach amenities all over Santa Monica that are free or low cost. Um, our parks, we have the beach house, we have the pier, and we have um, a, an infrastructure of hotels, motels, um, unfortunately, these are mostly skewed towards the higher end, although we do have the youth hostel, um, but the amenities along the beach are all free and open to the public. So the issue of visitor accommodation and low-cost visitor, what they call lower-cost overnight visitor accommodations, the, um, the language changes here and there, but essentially that's what we're talking about, um, is also a... Um, a goal of the Coastal Act to have affordable accommodations for visitors near the coast. So that takes different forms in different locations um, all up and down the coast. It could take the form of, of camping grounds and, and you know, trailer parks and hostels and other low cost kinds of, of visitor accommodations. In Santa Monica, that is not really feasible and our land costs are very high and so we kind of all scratch our heads well how can we do this we'd all love to have more affordable accommodations the city is certainly in favor of that um, but the reality of the market is it's very hard to do so um, one requirement that we have in our current co our current uh, land use plan and that we have proposed is that existing lower cost accommodation if it um, if uh, it's redeveloped uh, needs to pay a, an in lieu fee for those un, those uh, visitor rooms that were lost. So, as an example, the most recent example of that was at the Shore Hotel, um, which the Shore Hotel, which we're not going to get into the whole story of the Shore Hotel, but essentially that was one of those situations where there were lower cost um, uh, lower cost motels that were converted, and and a fee had to be paid. So the the Coastal Commission has um, responded or commented to our proposed LCP that, or LUP that they would like us to include a requirement that new accommodations would provide 25% of all new rooms as low-cost accommodation. And we have some issues with that. We're concerned that it may not be a legal requirement and it may not, it, it certainly isn't practical. The Coastal Act does not actually allow for something like, um, like how we have deed restricted low income housing, and you have to qualify for it. So, you know, if you have the low the lower cost accommodation, it's basically open to the whole public. Um, they are not allowed. You're not allowed to like, you know, only make it available to people who qualify. So, how you operate that, the practicality of these rooms, um, doesn't seem <laughs> to us to make a lot of sense. So this is another point of disagreement that we will continue to um, hold our ground on as we talk to the Coastal Commission. Um, yeah, okay, so the other issue with low-cost accommodation is um, short-term vacation rentals. And as you know, we don't allow those here. We haven't allowed them for more than 20 years. We've had a very strong policy and we've had a lot of strong enforcement over the last few years. Um, this is, we've had many discussions with the Coastal Commission staff and um, at, in this last letter that you received, they stated that they do not support a ban, an outright ban on short-term vacation rental. Um, this is a very huge point for the city of Santa Monica. We allow home sharing, but we don't allow you know, short-term vacation rental of the entire unit. And um, our proposed policy in the LUP aligns with our current city policy. And again, we'll, we'll see how that, that goes as we continue to discuss this with the Coastal Commission. So um, with that, I'm going to turn over the next few policy areas to Carrie Fukui. And Carrie's the assistant planner um, on this project who's been working with me for the last couple of years. Hey everyone. Um, so I'll start with the sea level rise policy. So this is 
Um, um, can you just raise your microphone oh. so we can hear you well? Thank you. Yeah. Is that, is that better? Yes. Great. Uh, so we'll start with sea level rise policies. Uh, so our approach to develop this section was to make sure we put together a set of policies where the city will be resilient in the face of sea level rise when climate change starts to impact our coast. And the way we did this was we worked with two different groups of scientists. One was from ESA, another from USGS, and they developed the COSMOS model. And we took their two models and compared them, and with their help, we aggregated their data to see where their predictions on and their models overlapped in the coastal impacts. Uh, from that, we're more accurately able to pinpoint within our coast areas that will be affected by uh, climate change. And from that, we developed our policies, and they're implemented in two different ways. So the first is through policy triggers. So once the LUP is certified, there's a batch of policies for the near term that will be immediately implemented. As we hit different sea level rise thresholds here in the midterm at 12.1 inches, then the midterm policies will be layered on top of that. And that's the same with the long-term policies. And this is all based off tidal gauge data that will be collected. Uh, the second implementation for this will be based on location. So we assess these five different coastal hazard zones, and this was pulled from those maps that I discussed earlier. So coastal erosion, uh, coastal storm flood, uh, monthly tidal flood zones, coastal seismic and liquefaction, and tsunami hazard zones. So these five hazard zones were developed on these maps, and they're projected out to 2100. So this is what we expect the impact to be at 2100. And so if there's a development or a parcel that's located within one of these hazard zones, there's specific policies that apply to them so they can address uh, these hazards. And I'll go over some of these policies. So there's these six policies that address hazard zones. Uh, the first is a real estate disclosure. So any property located within one of these hazard zones will have to disclose that they are part of that. Uh, CDP technical hazard analysis. So Projects will be required to submit a technical hazard analysis that, that shows how the property will be impacted by these coastal hazards. And this has to be included with their coastal development permit application. Um, and this is determined based on the life of the project, which is explained in another policy, number 58. And number 64 looks at conditions of approval for CDP. So this is a standard set of conditions that will apply to any project within a hazard zone and they'll, um, they're in place to make sure that they're preparing themselves for these future impacts. Uh, next would be coastal hazard or coastal flood hazard zone development, which establishes a base elevation requirement if that becomes necessary for projects on the coast. Um, this was derived from a FEMA standard as well as the maps that we developed that show the elevation of sea level rise. And then there's the shoreline development which establishes a required setback for any development on the shoreline. And we know our beaches are really wide, so this policy doesn't quite apply to us yet, but it's something that's required by the Coastal Commission, so we put it in to make sure that our LEP is consistent with the requirements. But also because we saw the maps of erosion and sea level rise, so at some point uh, the beach may be at a point where we will have to apply this policy of shoreline setbacks. And then there's the non-conforming structures and hazard zones. So this just defines what a non-conforming structure is within a hazard zone and sets standards for additions or repairs if something were to happen. Uh, the next policy is on shoreline protection. So the Coastal Act really discourages shoreline protection devices, especially uh, harder devices, which are like revetments or seawalls, and puts a preference to non-structural alternatives, um, which at the bottom you can see is beach nourishment, sand replenishment, or managed retreat. So this feeds into our policies on adaptive management, which really more focus on soft protection strategies. And policy 78, uh, this identifies high priority areas or high risk areas in the coast that uh, the city will start to develop strategies for, for adaptation specifically for these high risk areas. These are just a set of um, examples, so it's not a definitive list of places, so if more places are identified as these models are updated, they can be included in this as well. Uh, part of that is uh, beach nourishment, which may be one of the ad adaptation strategies, uh, which is a common one, so we put in a policy here to set conditions for if we were to move forward with a beach nourishment project, um, there are conditions for how to apply for the CDP for that. 
and potential mechanisms for shoreline protection and management. So these are just example management practices that are currently being used to handle sea level rise. Um, so we put a policy in place to say that the city will explore these different options. When the time comes that we actually implement these, the best practices may change. So this is just kind of a standing list. Uh, so we submitted these policies to the Coastal Commission and they responded with more technical responses and changes. Um, so it's some issues that we believe we can work through with them. And the next session section is environmental quality. Uh, currently, the city has some pretty aggressive uh, requirements for stormwater management. And this can be seen in the last few decades as Heal the Bay has released report cards for the water quality at our beaches and it's improved significantly. Uh, and a lot of that's due to these policies that require on-site rainwater harvesting or BMPs for all new development without, throughout the city. Um, and despite these efforts, there are still some issues like the Santa Monica Pier, which has a persistent problem of bacteria and pooling, a lot of it due to the birds that roost under the pier. So there's still some work that needs to be done to improve our water quality at the coast. And here for the BMPs, you can see since 1996, there have been over 2,000 uh, parcel-based systems installed, with a lot of them in the coastal zone. Uh, this includes the Clean Beaches project and SWIP and the SMURF, so some major uh, stormwater and dry water retention programs uh, being done by the city. Uh, environmental quality also includes biological resources. So within the coastal zone is a, um, uh, the western celery plover actually roosts within the coastal zone and it's a threatened species in California. Uh, so the city does a lot to protect these species already. There's an exclosure in the North Beach just south of the Annenberg Community Beach House. Um, it's open on one side to allow the birds to come in, but then discourages people from going in and then is kind of a marker so groomers know not to go through this site. Uh, additionally, there is the dune restoration pilot program just north of this. And since that's been in a, um, just over a year ago, it's already started to attract plovers to that site. And there's a nesting there, which is something that hasn't happened in Southern California in over 70 years. So our policy approach for environmental quality is to start with uh, incorporating the city's policies to reduce stormwater. Uh, this is done in policy 103, which puts the requirement of parcels needing to collect the first three quarter inch of rain during a storm event. Uh, this standard is actually slightly less than what the state requires, but it's applied to all land uses, whereas the state's requirements only to specific land uses. So doing this math, this policy actually captures a lot more than what would be normally required at the state level. Uh, and to do this, uh, city staff worked with coastal staff and state staff to develop this policy to make sure it captures what our local uh, policy is, but also conforms with the requirements of the Coastal Act. And for policy 105, this is to address what we discussed earlier about the pooling under the pier and in other places on the beach. So just for the city to continue to find ways that we can fix this problem. Uh, and the final policy, 111, this is just to incorporate the BMPs into the coastal zone to make sure that developments continue this practice. And our approach for biological resources within environmental quality. So continue to identify and protect coastal environmentally sensitive habitat uh, areas like the western snowy plover or any other uh, species that's threatened that may make their home in Santa Monica. Uh, that's seen in policy number 91 that says development shouldn't uh, be permitted if it endangers any species within the coastal zone. Also to continue to protect the western snowy plover and to assess the impacts of coastal, uh, coastal change and climate change on these species as well because it's not necessarily all human activity but can be some natural processes as well. And scenic and visual resources. So this section was included in the 1992 LUP. Uh, there was a map that had a few uh, scenic views pointed on it. Uh, but what it didn't do was really identify what was really being protected. So in this update, we uh, included on top of vantage points scenic corridors. And within these, we identified the public coastal views that are important to protect. So you can see on the Colorado Esplanade, we see this as an important vantage point to protect, but mostly focusing on the view down the middle to the coast. And here's an example of a scenic corridor that we've included where we've identified 
points where the view is important and with the photos and on the map as well. Uh, so our approach for this was to update what we designated as a significant scenic corridor and vantage point. A lot of this was done from the recommendation of the Planning Commission. Uh, and to focus on uh, policies that give more direction on what it means for developments that are within a viewshed of one of these scenic points. So you can see Tongva Park was a new one as well as Santa Monica Pier that used to be just a view but now we've reclassified it as a view corridor so that captures a view around the entire perimeter of the pier. Uh, so some policies to uh, apply to the scenic and visual resources. Uh, 140, it just states that the vantage points and scenic resources that are designated shall be protected. Uh, 141, the development within a view shed should be designed or cited to be compatible with the views. And 142 is, states that if there's a development that's within a view shed, they will submit a visual assessment to show how it impacts the designated view. and cultural and historic resources. So within the coastal zone, there are actually quite a bit of landmarks and historic resources in all three of the historic districts within the city. Um, for historic resources, there are some very iconic public uh, historic resources and landmarks like the Santa Monica Pier, Annenberg Community Beach House, uh, City Hall, Palisades Park, um, and the Civic Center. So our approach for these policies was really just to make sure that there is no uh, discrepancies between the landmarks ordinance and state agencies and specifically with the Coastal Commission. Uh, we saw the landmarks ordinance as thoroughly protecting the resources within the coastal zone, so there were no additional policies to address that. But we did come up with an issue when we were discussing with the Coastal Commission that they actually deem Mexican fan palms and Canary Island palms as invasive species in the coastal zone. Uh, whereas the city sees them as contributors to the historic landscapes of Palisades Park and City Hall. So after negotiating with them, we've submitted these two policies that allow for their maintenance and protection within these two sites despite their classification as an invasive species. And for the final section, I'm going to pass this back to Liz. Okay, so our last, our last uh, policy area is called uh, New Development, and these are policies that are both generally for the entire coastal zone and also for the specific sub-areas. And um, in this uh, update of the LUP, our goal was to um, bring all of these policies into alignment with the city's policies from the loose, the DCP, the the uh, Civic Center specific plan and to make sure that the heights and the FARs that are allowable are um, all um, in alignment. And um, so as you can see, the map here is, is pretty much the map from the loose. And what the other important thing that we're um, doing here in this update is that when in 1992 when the Coastal Commission certified the land use plan, they took out a bunch of policies that they did what they called, they created white holes, which means they deferred the certification because they had concerns about something. Um, and so our LUP has never really been a complete LUP. And uh, with this proposal, the draft that we um, have out right now and as it will be amended for the final draft will be a complete um, land use plan. So, we have a table that has the allowable heights and density, again, based on plans like the, um, our general plan and the DCP, CCSP. Um, I wanted to point out specifically um, the DCP. Um, it's a little blurry there, but we have um, in the downtown area incorporated both the um, maximum height that's allowed generally in the DCP and also the ELS, the, um, now I'm forgetting what ELS stands for, those established, established large. large sites um, that of which two of the three in the DCP are within the coastal zone and their maximum height is um, 130 feet. 
So I'm just going to highlight a few of the key policies from some of the sub areas um, in the beach sub area, which actually the state beach is one of the areas that was white holed in the 92 LUP because of concerns about Proposition S, the beach overlay um, district, which had only just been approved shortly before the certification. So um, now we are um, incorporating Proposition S um, standards or the beach overlay district into that, that sub area. The pier, in addition to some of what we already discussed in terms of access, um, also incorporates the, the um, terms of Proposition S. And the pier actually has some exemption from um, the requirements or, or rather the um, prohibited uses of Proposition S for a, in which 140,000 square feet can be developed on the pier um, of, of uses that are permitted. So in other words, I haven't really gone into the details of Prop S, but Prop S um, prohibits development of hotels and restaurants over 2,000 square feet. So on the pier, new restaurants over 2,000 square feet can be developed up until this maximum of the 140,000 is reached. And this is an area that there's a lot of um, confusion about. And when we started this process, one of the things we did is worked with um, HED, which um, Housing and Economic Development, and they managed the pier. And um, a memo came out of that, which is included in one of the appendices of the LUP, which clarifies the situation, sets the baseline, and we hope will um, lead to a lot less confusion, both here and at the Coastal Commission with peer development. In sub area three, the only additional kind of layer that's been put over our existing policies that's from the, the coastal policy um, viewpoint is on Ocean Avenue, because Ocean Avenue is a very uh, important key street in terms of uh, coastal recreation and visitor use. So properties on Ocean Avenue have this additional uh, layer of policy from the land use plan related to providing visitor serving uses, enhancing public views, um, encouraging things like terraces and balconies and view platforms. And most of this, I think, was in the uh, previous LUP as well. And in downtown, similarly on Ocean Avenue, um, office and residential uses are not permitted on the ground floor except in rear, and, uh, but are permitted on upper floors. And again, that's to keep Ocean Avenue as primarily an active visitor serving street. In the Civic Center, the um, proposed LUP incorporates the Civic Center specific plan. This is another area that was, that was white hold at the time because um, my understanding is that the Civic Center specific plan, which had been approved, was going through some revisions. And because of that, the Coastal Commission just basically crossed out those policies and said, come back to us when you've um, uh, adopted the Civic Center specific plan. And that was 25 years ago. So now we're coming back to them and we're incorporating that into this. And importantly, the uh, shared parking in the Civic Center, which is a uh, basic tenet of how the Civic Center development has, has developed over all these years and continues to develop. Um, so shared parking serving all uses is um, incorporated into the LUP through this policy. And last one, sub area eight, which is in Ocean Park. Um, because the Coastal Act seeks to ensure that um, local development doesn't overpower the, the coastal resources, the recreational resources, there's actually a requirement to develop recreational resources to serve your local residents. And so, hence we have this policy of encouraging um, additional, maintaining parks and encouraging additional um, parks in Ocean Park. And at the Recreation and Parks Commission um, last week, they uh, also asked that we consider a similar policy in um, sub area four, which is the northern residential area, and also in um, downtown, which is also which is compatible with the DCP that encourages more park development too. So we um, will probably consider adding that to the final draft. And so. With that, we've gone through all of our policy areas and discussion of some of um, our ongoing issues with the Coastal Commission, and we'd like to 
return this to you for your discussion, and we can go through these questions when you're ready to do that. Um, we have two chits. Do you guys want to hear those first and then start the questions? Okay, those are Roseanne Lair and Jackson McNeil. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Ruth Ann Lehrer. I'm representing the Santa Monica Conservancy. And um, this is a, a pretty impressive document. Um, in the interest of making it even better, um, we have some comments and suggestions to offer. Um, one correction I'd like to make is that the Loof Hippodrome is not only listed on the National Register. It's a National Historic Landmark. That's the highest level of significance that exists so it's very impressive, and I was very impressed myself when I found that out. So I think that should be noted in this document. Um, then I noticed that the section on coastal zone parks omits mention of Carousel Park. Now, Carousel Park, you may not have noticed this as a distinct entity, but it's located southeast of the Loof Hippodrome and acts as a connector between the pier and oceanfront walk. Um, it provides access to the pier for wheelchairs, bicycles, and multiple users. Um, it consists of interconnected design elements that reflect the pier, the Loof Hippodrome, and beach culture, both real and imaginary. The children's play features are just one part of this park, and it was designed by the renowned team of Moore, Rubel, Udell architects and Campbell and Campbell landscape architects. Um, I could go on and tell you more about this, but I don't want to use up all the time on that. But it's important to note that this is a distinct park entity and should be included among the parks that are listed in the, in the plan. Um, the plan includes a third uh, map of the cultural resources, but um, to anybody who wants to use this plan, it would be very helpful if there were a list of what those cultural resources were with their names and addresses. This would make it much more helpful um, to, and, and user friendly. In addition, structures of merit should be included as well as landmarks because there is one in, in, on Ocean Park Boulevard, so that should be included. We strongly commend the policy recommendation about the Mexican fan palms and Canary Island date palms in Palisades Park to encourage their retention as historic landscape features. They're both character-defining features of this historic cultural landscape. Replacing them in kind is necessary and appropriate as an exception to their classification as invasive species. These features date from the park's earliest days. They're part of a kind of Beaux-Arts planning principle. They're allays. And the view from the beach of the Mexican fan palms on their skinny trunks from the beach up the park is one of the defining features of the Santa Monica identity. I wanted to uh, mention something about ADA access, which is a challenge. Um, it's worth mentioning that there exists now an ADA path to the beach that's really, I, I don't think, identified and people don't know about it. So I'd like to tell you what that is. Whoops, do I get any, am I up? Uh, Right, Could you please tell us what it is? <laughs> what the ADA, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a path that goes from Ocean Avenue down Mumat Ahikoko Way, winds a uh, switchback around the Smurf facility, down Moss Avenue, over across Ocean Park Walk, and up Carousel Park, the, the pathway that I described to you before. So this is really an important uh, element of beach access, and I think you need to include that as well. Um, I wanted to, can I mention one more thing? <laughs> I'm things? dying to know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. We only have two speakers, so okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to mention also that um, it should be emphasized that the uh, Annenberg Community Beach House activities are free. And that makes them even more accessible. In addition to which, um, if you like, you can take a docent-led tour from Santa Monica Conservancy volunteers of the guest house which adds an educational component to all the list of the recreational components. So I thought that was worth uh, putting in. The other final note is that uh, under policies where um, there's very detailed analysis of, of archeological and paleontological resources, and we do have an ordinance, it seemed to me that there might be some way of better integrating some mention of cultural resources in this section. I was looking in particular at policy 161, which seemed to me to be 
uh, possible to incorporate cultural resources into that. So for your consideration, and I thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Jackson McNeil and then Paula Larmore. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Jackson McNeil. I represent six families that own the properties at 1601 through 1619 Oceanfront Walk, uh, which is right at the base of the Santa Monica Pier Bridge and also includes three city-designated landmarks. Um, I'm here for a, a pretty narrow reason. I'm here to ask this commission to recommend that the Oceanfront Walk pathway uh, be considered a scenic corridor in the LUP, um, at least in the area near the pier. Uh, the draft LUP as it currently exists identifies six scenic corridors, including the Santa Monica Pier, Bernard Way, Palisades Beach Road, the California Incline, Adelaide Drive, and Ocean Avenue along the bluffs. Um, but the reasons that the LUP uses to justify those as scenic corridors also apply to Oceanfront Walk as well. Um, importantly, like the other cor corridors, they include incredible views of the beach, the ocean, um, the pier, the Louf Hippodrome, which we just heard about, uh, my client's landmark properties, uh, just incredible views. And uh, they're an important pedestrian and bicycle route for residents and for tourists and visitors to the ocean. And unlike most of the other named corridors in the draft LUP, um, they're accessed and a vista for pedestrians and bicyclists, whereas most of the other corridors named in the draft LUP are primarily vistas for uh, motorists. Um, the Coastal Act mandates that these uh, views be protected and the commission should do what it can um, to ensure that Oceanfront Walk is, is named as a scenic corridor. As you may know, this is not just a, a problem in the abstract, as you might be aware. The city just um, released a draft EIR on the Pier Bridge replacement project. Um, the city's preferred alternative includes a new vehicular bridge at Moss Avenue, uh, which if constructed would uh, potentially have significant and adverse visual impacts um, to that whole area, including um, visual impacts to the Louf Hippodrome, to the pier, uh, to the beach, to my client's landmark properties on Oceanfront Walk and that whole Oceanfront Walk um, area. So this is, uh, the need for a scenic corridor here is real. It's not just imagined. And we ask that this commission uh, recommend that this scenic corridor uh, be included in the LUP. Thank you. Question. Question. I assume uh, when you say with scenic corridor, you mean uh, to the west, to the ocean. Yeah, in the draft LUP, you can identify sort of cer certain uh, directions. They use actual arrows in, in the graphic. And, and yes, primarily to the west. But I also imagine that if you're, for example, south of the pier looking north, you would also want to protect views to the Hippodrome and to the amusements on the pier and to my client's landmarks on um, uh, to the east. So yes, definitely to the west and to the ocean and the bay, but, but also from certain places um, looking towards the pier as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paula Larmore, please. Good evening, Commission. Paul Larmore with Harding Larmore, Kutcher & Kozel. I wasn't planning to speak tonight, but I think this March 20th letter from the Coastal Commission staff is really important. So I wanted to provide a little bit more context to someone who deals with even the smallest of permits that have to go to Coastal Commission. Um, so our current LCP, which is partially certified, is from 1992. That means it was before the 2010 lease, the 2015 zoning ordinance, and the 2017 DCP. So it's really important for properties in the coastal zone to have an LCP that's updated and is it consistent with our loose, our general plan, the zoning ordinance and the DCP. Because right now, if you're in the coastal zone and you're 100% consistent with the DCP and the zoning ordinance and the loose, you still may be in complete conflict with the 1992 LCP. And when I go up to coastal for my coastal permit for my maybe my small change of use from a retail store to a restaurant, I'm in a very weird position where I'm inconsistent with the partially certified LCP. I'm consistent with the city's documents, but the Coastal Commission hasn't reviewed or approved any of our land use plans, zoning ordinance, DCP. So I just think it's really critical to think, keep that in mind and take Coastal Commission staff's input very seriously. 
Um, and so in particular, I wanted to address the second question on the screen tonight about the parking standards are the proposed exemptions. One proposed exemption from having to provide new parking for new development is for the downtown community plan area. That was a council decision made in the downtown community plan and that applies to zoning compliant projects. Um, that is in the zoning ordinance. I think, although obviously I don't know for sure, but I think that many people anticipated that larger development projects processed through a development agreement would still have a parking, would still provide some level of parking, that the city wouldn't approve a project that's adjacent to a residential neighborhood without any parking, but I don't think that was the vision. So I do think that there's some nuances that could be crafted in this LCP to make the Coastal Commission staff as well as residents and others comfortable that just because you're in the downtown plan, if you're doing something over zoning ordinance, it doesn't mean you just get to say zero parking and that's it, I'm golden. Because I don't think you're gonna get an LCP certified by the Coastal Commission with this current exemption. And I think continue to take that hard line with coastal staff could end us in a position where we, again, don't get an LCP ever certified and it's a waste of all of this time that we're doing for the next couple of years. So I do think it's really important to think about, yes, we want to continue to be aggressive with mobility and ride share and alternative modes of transportation, but also to be pragmatic and practical and thinking about where can we be nuanced on our policies and recognize um, where can we get to a, a yes with Coastal Commission because there's no point in trying to push something through that they're going to deny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jason Perry. You referenced a letter from the Coastal Commission. Uh, right. is it, was that something to the city? Yes, and um, uh, Liz referenced it in her staff report, and, and um, I just picked up a copy right now. It's dated yesterday. Okay. And do we uh, it was emailed to us this afternoon. Oh. Sorry, we couldn't get it Thank to you, you any earlier. It only came in yesterday night. So. Um, all right, uh, Mario also has a yeah. question. Uh, you, you zeroed in on a conflict between uh, parking uh, exemptions, let's say, adjacent to residential. Are you using that just as a generic example, or are there other areas that you feel there are conflicts that, quote, unquote, could torpedo the whole project, the whole alignment of these two different plans? So my understanding in speaking with city staff is that they've gone back and forth with Coastal on many of the issues and now they're in alignment on, on many of the issues. Um, and at the time when we spoke to staff a couple weeks ago, they hadn't received this letter. So I think it was kind of up in the air still whether or not Coastal would be open to this exemption in the downtown area. And now it's very clear they're, they're not. Um, I think this letter, again, I just got it from from you today outlines the places that appear to be remaining separate and apart from that I do think there's other ways the city could bolster the LCP to put it in a better position to be certified um, even if coastal's okay with it now it still has to be approved by the Commission and we submitted some suggestions for how to do that as well so you submitted them to the staff or to, so us? to the staff and um, staff I understand forwarded them to you they're in the back of that attachment and I'll just the one example is in the prop S zone okay we we've the city has done a tremendous job at, at now protecting the existing hotels and I just think the city should take more credit for that because since prop S prohibits new hotels and that was the reason why we only have a partially certified LCP I just think we should talk about what significant policy changes we've had since 1992 uh, and take credit for that because we Prop S did, has not had the same effects that Coastal Commission was concerned about at the time. We have a lot of hotels still in the coastal zone area and the city's done a great job of uh, incentivizing them right outside the coastal, uh, right outside the Prop, Prop S area, still in the coastal zone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that closes the public hearing, and now uh, we're ready for questions of staff. Uh, does anybody have questions of staff? <laughs> Leslie Lambert has a question from staff. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a number of questions, but a few come to mind first, so I'll follow up with later questions. Um, where does the Gateway Master Plan fit in all this? <laughs> Um, well, 
a large part of the development in the Gateway Master Plan is not in the coastal zone because it's east of 4th Street. And um, the part that's west of 4th Street might be like um, like the freeway bridge. Oh, that's a good point. It is east of 4th Street. So it yeah. wouldn't affect the LUP. Right. Okay. Except po possibly bridges over the freeway kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, since nobody else is pressing their buttons, I have <laughs> a question. Um, I was noting in the uh, uh, presentation that uh, there's a parking exemption for single family residences in the coastal zone that are la adding less than 50% uh, of their area. And we have in our bucket list somewhere a possibility of adjusting that for our own code for when you have to upgrade your parking. And uh, I noted in the letter from the Coastal Commission that they said, you know, if we change a policy in our laws, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It has to stick to what's in the book. And so I'm wondering, since it might take us a while, or, you know, if we can have that particular thing, is it possible to make it so that it's more flexible so that it can match our code? I just feel like mm -hmm. that particular code is it has an equity issue, and I want to make sure that it right. um, matches since we're in the middle of changing it. I think Jing wants to answer this one. Yeah, and, and yeah. Um, that was actually one that we had, as we were looking through this just the other day, actually um, kind of looking at it anew, given that those discussions have been relatively recent. Um, it's definitely something we want to think about. We'll have to go back to talk with coastal staff mm -hmm. about that, because obviously we don't want to put ourselves in an endless loop of having to amend for things mm -hmm. in the coastal zone. Um, something that the details of that are quite particular and are more likely going to be addressed in the IP, the coastal zoning mm -hmm. ordinance part of it, but um, definitely noted that, um, you know, I think we want to pursue a policy that might give us the flexibility uh, for that future change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Leslie? Um, I did. No, I'm talking about Oh, I'm <laughs> we're just getting used to a new system up here. Um, this this is probably uh, well, whatever. My my question is: It appears that the Coastal Commission is very concerned about parking for the pier, but it also appears that there are thousands of parking spaces near the pier that are walkable, mm -hmm. and and that there may be there is an ADA solution for getting to the pier. Um, how would how do you think the Coastal Commission would respond to the proposal that we take all parking off the pier? So the LUP policy, and this is policy number 18, basically, and, and this is one they've reviewed and have indicated that they're supportive of it. So um, says that parking needs to be within a quarter mile, that there has to be adequate parking within a quarter mile. And then that can include parking on the pier as well as parking on the beach. Interesting. As well as parking in you know other locations. Um, like other beach lots, maybe not the one right next to the pier. So, so you don't anticipate they would have a problem if we took the parking lot mm -hmm. off the pier, which would uh, eliminate the need for the parking bridge or auto bridge or whatever it is. Well, you never, you never know with the Coastal Commission, so I'm not going to say they have no problem. Well, they're, it, they're like 117 but spaces. But they are, they are open to a policy that um, is flexible for the city to consider um, not having parking on the pier in the future. Okay, the other question I have is, um, I understand the complications of doing a 25% affordability requirement in hotels. I mean, that would be like, you know, kill me now and end the pain. But is, is the major issue, I mean, if we could somehow find a nexus and find a rationale for doing so, is the major issue qualifying people for those uh, hotel rooms? No, I think the major, the major issue is that we don't, um, and I, maybe our city attorney can speak to this more uh, eloquently, but we, we don't think that the Coastal Act really requ um, requires that kind of a policy, and we feel that it has some legal issues for um, our, our imposing that on, de on developers when there's no removal no replacement. Of, of existing um, low-income. So the Shore Hotel was an exception because it did remove affordable yes. units. Um, yeah. So th th is there no way we could do a nexus study or something like that to? So I, I think from a practical perspective as well is that if you want to, let's call it de deed restrict hotel rooms for low income families or something, um, you know, th for all practical purposes, how are you going to income qualify 
how is you know how do we know it's actually Education. serving the intended population? Well, you bring your uh, tax forms with you. <laughs> I mean, we all yeah, walk I mean, around with them, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, the I just Coastal Act yeah. specifically yeah. prohibits the commission from requiring that kind of thing beyond replacement. They cannot uh, no, establish. Re yeah, they, they they can't actually establish like a rate Crit or like criteria criteria for, for who can for stay who in can a. Oh, really? Term. So it, yeah. it appears to be internally inconsistent with what the Coastal Act actually says. Totally. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, to, to just, we're just thinking about the practical implementation and how you would even do that and whether it even serves that population. In addition mm -hmm. to the legal questions of, uh, you know, how could you require a new develop, new hotel building that's replacing no hotel um, to include this kind of, of a requirement, it's um, a, a little puzzling to us. Well, I suppose the same way we require housing developers to include affordable units. I mean, if the, somehow the bridge could be built. Right, it's a, but that's basis on, on a nexus. Well, the other thought I had was um, I, I, I've never understood where our hotel mitigation fees go. Um, so, well, I can, I, I can tell you Can you, you help actually. me with that? So, yeah, they do actually go into a specific fund where they are earmarked to be used for low cost accommodation projects. And for instance, here in Santa Monica, they've been used for the uh, youth hostel right, on Second right. Street. But that was years ago. I mean, right. if there were enough accumulated in the fund, could we right. potentially buy hotel rooms, basically, and keep them affordable? Or, or up front, right. do a development subsidy up right. front like we do with housing? Right. Well, as with most kinds of opportunities like that, when the city has these funds that are available, a, a process go. there's a process um, where there would be an RFP and an interested developer who wanted to develop low-cost accommodations could put forth their proposal, and um, the youth hostel, for instance, could be one of those, or there could be others. Um, so, um, but that's how it, that's how that money gets spent. I, I just I can't imagine Ritz Carlton uh, re responding to an RFP like that. But that right, right, they wouldn't be the developer who'd respond. Yeah, to that. thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, Mario. Well, I have a couple of questions, and I don't know which of these Gary might want to answer, but. Um, Let's start with the peer. Um, for, by the way, let me say this is a great document, and it's very yeah. dense reading, uh, but it looks like you have considered many things from many different angles, and it's really wonderful to see that laid out. The, uh, the biggest question, of course, is the uncertainty of sea level rise, mm -hmm. and particularly on our biggest cultural asset, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. is the peer. So from what you know today, our peer at which point will you have to make some changes to the pier to deal with sea level rise? Is right. it certainly not in the first foot, but is it in the midterm or is it the long term that the pier starts right. to suffer? Well, in, in the scenarios that we have seen, the level of sea level rise is below the level of the pier deck. So on a sort of daily basis, we don't, we have not seen from the science that we've been shown so far, We've not seen a scenario where the water is like right up to the pier deck or... or well, obviously deck. not. It, it, so the issue becomes more storm situations. Extreme right? situations, yes. Right, right. Those extreme storms which are forecast to be more common in the future than they've been in the past. So a 100-year storm might start to be a 50-year storm. And mm -hmm. so... Um, and that's why I think one of the um, requ one of the requirements that Carrie pointed out was the scour analysis, so that when there is a storm event of a certain level, there's a requirement for the city to do the scour analysis and see what impact has that had on the pier, and draw conclusions about what needs to be done to protect the pier or to right um, to see what's going on. So specifically in that case, for example. When was the last storm that we would have to do a scour analysis for? Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So you see, you see where this mm -hmm. is going, mm -hmm. and a lot of this has to do with benchmarking. There's a lot of things in here that are supposed to be triggered by specific changes. When we reach right. thirty percent of this, or when we reach a certain height of that, blah blah right. blah blah. Right. I want to know: Do we have the benchmarks to measure from in place today? so that these measurements that trigger the changes right. are real as opposed to, well, maybe we think we had that in 1982, you know, well, that kind of thing. I do believe that we have the benchmarks from a lot of the studies that have been done recently, um, but it is a question that um, there, there are a lot of new requirements in this LUP for the city to monitor things that are going on. And so some of those might be done by county agencies 
Mm -hmm. might be done by state agencies, but they might not be, and then they might fall on the city to do our own right. continuing and, analysis. So that becomes an obligation under the LUP. Okay. And where might that funding come from to do those things if the state uh, doesn't do them? Or that's above my pay grade. I okay. Well, let me turn to where the question is really going. <laughs> um, one of the ideals of this whole thing was that by bringing the approval of projects in house, it would cost no more to get a plan approved by planning in coastal zone than it does in the non-coastal zone because it would be the same checks. It would be the same parking, the same heights, setbacks, density, blah, 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 blah. From what you know today, is that achievable? With, in other words, is there no surcharge from the planning approval process or any of these other parasitic costs that get dragged in uh, from an a an project's point of view than anywhere in the, in the city? I, I think real, I mean, yes, you know, that's a, that, that's obviously the, the goal here is why, mm -hmm. why we're going through this process is to bring the coastal, the, the CDP process, you know, under local control, um, you know, but, you know, truthfully, it's a long road. Um, you know, we're just right. in the LUP phase. We still have to work through the IP, which is where a lot of the details live. Um, and, you know, the city has never had um, a fully certified um, LCP because the IP part, um, you know, was, was left out of the 92 ordinance. So, you know, to the extent that, you know, I, I would say yes, you know, in concept, in theory, yes. You know, we're supposed to bring it in so that we review all of these at once, just like many coastal cities you issue you know, whether it's a DR or what have you, and it just has a CDP attached to it. And what you're looking at is conformance with not only the city's uh, land-based policies, but you have a, 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 a distinct coastal zoning ordinance within which that development is reviewed. Yeah, I would just add that um, once, you know, hopefully when we get to that point where we have the CDP, mm -hmm. then we would do a, a fee analysis to figure out if there's any additional um, fee that should be charged for such a permit. So that would be part of the analysis once we get to that point, but it would be, as Jing said, a few years down the road. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of other fairly simple questions. Are, are we still doing any beach nourishment? It, they refers to in the document that it was done in the okay. past. Okay. Is it happening anywhere today in our, on our beach or in, in, in the likely immediate horizon, let's say? My understanding is that we have that's something we have not done for a while. Okay, and there's no no need to at this time, given this where time. we are today, to do that to keep doing that. Okay, uh, another question is there seems to be one of the issues is the increase, possible increase in liquefaction zones that are possibly heading our way. Uh, do we have an overlaid map that shows? how the liquefaction zone might increase as we reach the different three, the three benchmarks, let's say. Um, so, in other words, the map that you're looking at looks at the end state and you want to see the in-betweens? Yeah, yeah, those maps do exist. I don't think that we put them in in that form, right, in the LUP. Okay. Um, it, it could be done. Okay, because that would be them. valuable to know because if that thing starts to grow, uh, quicker than we thought, or differentially, where the, uh, let's say, the liquefaction zone is growing faster than the splash zone or the tsunami zone, then it'd be good to know that, you know. Uh, so, um, and the last thing is the, um, you have a situation where um, it's, there's a comment in the, in the staff report here that the Smurf overflow is going into the sewer system. Did I understand that correctly? Um, yeah, that was my reaction. I'm not, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't pa remember page putting 66. That in the staff report, yeah, not in the staff report, it's on page 66. Oh, of, in the LUP. In oh, the LUP. Okay. Uh, that was a little surprise. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll give you the page number. You don't have to answer it now unless you know, obviously. But it seemed a little right. bit surprising. But I think that um, I think that that is the case. If there is to, if if the amount of water coming into the Smurf is beyond what it can handle. But why would it so, go into the sewer system as opposed to the storm drain system? Um, I I'm not sure. I mean, 
some of some of the details of that was written and reviewed by our water resources people so I trust it to be the case okay so. thank you thank you uh, Jason is next yeah I have some questions about the sea level rise policy thresholds mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just hoping that you can kind of paint the picture of uh, what kind of changes or what properties would be affected by these changes in the midterm and long term and what types of, of um, proposals for those properties or for those areas uh, would would fall under this this category of this this these changing requirements okay so for instance um, in map B if we look at the coastal storm flood hazard zones is that what you're um, your question so if you 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 can see that in the so so this map actually shows like the highest level the aggregate highest levels um, reached in 20 in a 2100 scene which is the highest a higher level of sea level rise um, and so you can you can actually kind of see that it kind of goes up to Palisades Beach Road it doesn't it isn't um, forecast at least from what we know so far, right, the current science, right, science can change, but from what we're being told now, um, with the best available science, um, it does not look in Santa Monica like these flood hazard zones would extend to over PCH and, they, and to the bluffs and, and up that way. Um, also, um, and so in the south, as you can see it on the map, it goes to kind of Barnard Way. But what this map doesn't show is that because we have time and we have knowledge that, that sea level rise is coming, it gives us time to do the, ad the adaptation strategies um, that Terry talked about in his presentation, the dunes, beach nourishment, but, and other kinds of um, things that could be done to try to slow down storm waters. Because again, our scenario that we're being told in Santa Monica is not that sea level rise is going to um, take over the whole beach, but rather storm scenarios are going to start a little further in and be stronger and have more devastation. But because the scenarios are out um, in longer term, it means the city has some time to, to perhaps try to ameliorate that. Mm -hmm. And do we expect that these policies would affect uh, homes that are west of PCH? Homes that are west of PCH, um, yeah, right. So in other words, if you were on, if you had a home on Palisades Beach Road, um, these policies would require you almost immediately to have to, for instance, do this disclosure re requirement and say, Here's the map, here's what it says. It doesn't say that there's sea level rise today. It doesn't say in the next 20 years, but it does say that in a longer term scenario, this is a property that could be affected. So we're not um, requiring a disclosure for more than needs to be disclosed, but also not for less than needs to be disclosed. And then as the, you know, if, if sea level, uh, if the sea level does rise as forecast, uh, then additional requirements are triggered. Can, can you give us some examples right. of for a property owner in that area, what what are the kinds of things they might have to do? Or would yeah. it only affect uh, new proposals that they're putting forward? Or every, every property would then have to go make modifications? Well, um, first of all, some of the specifics would be put into the implementation plan. So, um, you know, to look at the policies today and know exactly what somebody proposing um, to add um, another bathroom to their, you know, home on Palisades Beach Road, what will they be required to do? It's not something I'm able to answer right now. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, it would be based on the um, the life the life ex uh, expectancy of the um, project, which is. Carrie mentioned, um, and that's defined, I think, as policy 58 that says if, that defines like how long, you know, what is the lifespan of a, this kind of building or that kind of building or a road or whatever, and where does that take us out in terms of 
scenarios and does that take us out into what could be a high sea level scenario and if so then what is it you're building and what could be affected so there's a lot of questions um, that would lead to that answer so is it is it accurate to say that the uh, that the proposed land use plan is establishing the categories and then the implementation plan would articulate what mm -hmm. needs to happen within those categories right the I mean the implementation plan would be the like the it would be a coastal zoning ordinance and so it would be a lot more specific about you know those about exactly what mm -hmm. would be needed to be done so in terms of uh, uh, resilience mm -hmm. strategies that that those ideas would be articulated at that point that within the IP resilient strategies on a for for, 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 for a property, property or for a globe on the on a larger basis somebody wants to build something what right. what kind of uh, uh, requirements are they going to have are they going to be facing mm -hmm. um, in order to in, in anticipation of higher sea levels Right, that would be more specified. That would be articulated. But, yeah, in that would the, be articulated. In the implementation plan. Right, but again, the the um, depending on what actually happens, right? You know, are we going to? And we had a really great presentation about this at our um, sea level rise discussion last week. Um, but depending on what happens with greenhouse gases, are people going to reduce greenhouse gases? globally so that sea level rise slows down in which case the scenarios all get pushed out or not and secondly you know if uh, we start putting more things like dunes on the beach right that in, in certain areas if we find that those work and we're experimenting with those so is that the answer to everything no not necessarily but strategies like that that might be tried would those then change the science because you go back and you know and do the analysis with a different structure of, on your beach does that change the analysis and does that then change the impact on a specific property so there's a lot of variables that could change over time so this is setting a baseline for what we know today and based on our beach that we have today but you know there's a lot of things that will play into it over time Okay, and the chair asked my question about, um, I had the same idea about the 50% threshold since we were talking about it for the rest of the city. Uh, and then with, um, with bike parking, uh, the, the language uh, in, in at least one of the policies was bike parking near the pier. Mm -hmm. uh, are there reasons not to encourage it on the pier? Um, I think we didn't want to be necessarily specific if there are at the, at the moment there are not really bike paths and bike facilities on the pier so um, well, yeah. is there within the you know within the LUP do you see a problem with broadening it to include op opportunity on the pier itself it's probably not a problem if it's if it's an option, um, but I think it has to be part of the, that an, a, a larger overall look at how bicycles fit onto the pier. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had a question, which uh, I talked about with you a little bit offline, and I was wondering about those tunnels that are under the park that I'm concerned about they've been there for so long they're held up by timbers from 1934 and now water could be coming towards them in big storms and is that something that I mean do we know anything about them are they falling down is Palisades Park gonna fall into them do you see what I'm saying <laughs> um, interestingly I, I worked kind of on that project one of the first things when I first got here so I had to go back in a while back, yeah, uh -huh. to, to look up the environmental document. There is some mention of the tunnels as a, um, a point at which, j just to identify different zones where the soil, soil nailing and mm -hmm. bluff stabilization occurs. Um, we didn't have a chance to really research this deeper with 
um, our colleagues in public works, you might know a little better, but my, 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 my sense is given the, um, the scope of that project and what it was intended to do is that those tunnels were probably, as you say, you know, they're not seen anymore. I think that they've been stabilized or they may not be there anymore. Um, but we can, it, it's a little research project we can certainly find out more about. <laughs> Because um, there was quite a bit of work that was done to stabilize the bluffs, because they were there's right. definitely issues with um, structures like that, and you know holes from animals and what have you that you know have kind of affected it over time. Right. I'm just you mm -hmm. know I just want to make sure that it doesn't get overlooked because back in the 30s they drilled a lot of holes in that bluff yeah. from yeah. a lot of different directions, right. so which was a, yeah. top down, top down, bottom <laughs> up. Yeah. Through, you wouldn't believe what they were doing. Yeah. But in terms of the storm, storm damage, the uh, higher level storm scenarios don't go that far. They yeah, don't actually it, cross PCH in, in the maps that we have been given by both of these um, scientific studies. But it also said in the report that sea level rise could raise the water table and mm -hmm. a lot, the reason they dug those tunnels was to relieve pressure from springs. Mm -hmm. So maybe springs could have more pressure. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just worried about my pretty park on top. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. With the fan uh, That's Leslie. Yeah, I, I hate to appear slow on this issue, um, even though I am. Um, on page five of the Coastal Commission um, staff response, I want to just make sure I understand this. We all agree that there would be on-site replacement on a one-for-one -one basis of affordable hotel units that are removed, right? Replacement. Mm -hmm. But then they go on to say, and I think you said this, that for new hotel projects in the coastal zone, 25% of the rooms must be affordable. And if that's, whether replacement or not, um, and if that's infeasible, which it likely is, then um, you can collect a fee, a mitigation fee, which goes into a fund to be directed toward affordable, unit, affordable hotel rooms somewhere, presumably, in Santa Monica. Is that, am I understanding that? That's the way I read this. Yeah, this, that's. Right. First, first there is providing it on site. Then there's providing it in on, another location. Right. And then third, um, the a fee. But those funds are to be used for construction of affordable hotel units somewhere. Right. Um, and are we in agreement with that? No. <laughs> no, we we are not in agreement with that yeah. policy. And that's one of. How are you going to um, finesse that? Well, it's not a matter of finessing. Right now, there's no statutory requirement in the, in the law coastal which Act. requires right. this. This is coastal staff's I gotcha. wish list or interpretation. I got it. Okay. Further discussions will be had. Mm -hmm. uh, Mario? Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The area north of Pico is much more endangered than the area south of Pico in terms of uh, it, buildings. I'm not sure what you mean. Well, with these maps, it seems that... Oh, you mean on, just on the coastline? Yeah, the coastline. along the coastline, whether you're okay. looking at storm surge, whether you're looking at sea level rise, or whether you're looking at all these different indices, it seems like uh, the area of, you know, Palisades Walk or Oceanfront Walk there north of the pier is going to get totally hammered at some point sooner than later whereas the let's say the Ocean Park area for lack of a better term is up on a little bluff and that little bluff makes a big difference so for instance Casa del Mar at a certain point will have a swimming pool like they used to have 50 years ago in their on the ground floor Okay, so south of, yeah, south of Pico. But south of Pico is relatively free of buildings except our bathrooms, to be honest, and our parking kiosks are being in danger. But okay. north of Pico and north of the pier, you're losing big bucks. You're losing homes. You're losing, you know, parking facilities you're using. And okay. we've already got three capital improvement projects going into that. We have the big... A swimming pool that we're building for the storm surge for the storm runoff we have the pier right. bridge coming in there and we also have mm -hmm. the beach walk uh, the the bike path that we're redoing right. all the way north to the city boundaries um, and so my question is 
we're very fortunate that area, particularly north of the pier, mm -hmm. uh, is one of the broadest beaches and therefore could most easily accommodate, for instance, sand dunes. And it seems that the only reason we're not letting nature take its course and create the sand dunes it would normally do or do with very little incentive is we have this idea that we have to continually comb the beach. Um, so we have a conflict there between a natural defense that would establish itself if we did nothing right. and we're continually plowing the beach to a level area. Can you talk about that and uh, w why we wouldn't just let the sand dunes do their sand duny thing and the mm -hmm. snowy plovers benefit from that? Um, well, I'm, you know, I think what you're hitting on is what could be a direction in the future. So, I mean, this is just a, a much bigger discussion mm -hmm. to be had um, by the city. Do we switch our thinking about the beach? Um, we have not had that discussion yet and decided that we're not going to comb the beaches anymore. Um, people still come and want to have mm -hmm. the flat beaches, and it's part of our tourism infrastructure. Right. And I'm sure there are interests in keeping the beaches, maintaining them the way we've always maintained them. Um, at the same time, there might be interest in doing something different. We've ex we're, we, uh, the city allowed an experiment by the Bay Foundation mm -hmm. to do this dune that's now up there um, in the North Beach area. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Snowy Clover area, which, which is being done for different reasons, um, is also creating a kind of natural dunescape. And so we will have examples on our beach to mm -hmm. see what that's like, and it'll just be part of an ongoing discussion um, going forward about, you know, what's the most, you know, sustainable, practical thing to do on our beach as, as the sea level rise actually starts to be experienced. And that's another important thing to remember when we have these discussions, because sometimes we like leap into looking at this um, at map B, for instance, and say, you know, oh no, you know, we're, we're going to have a flood tomorrow, and it's not really tomorrow. At the same time, we do know that, you know, there's global warming and there's sea level rise, mm -hmm. and we're, you know, we need to kind of approach it on a really kind of rational basis, knowing that we are in a fortunate position that we have the time to do that. Um, the time doesn't mean we have two centuries to do it, but we right. probably have almost a whole century. Well, we also to get have to a different state. we have the time, but in our particular case, north of the pier, we have the width to do it. We're not right, That's right why there. We have the time. Exactly, we're right. trading space for time in this in this particular scenario. Uh, what I'm, I'm guessing are there any other experiments that you think are worth doing? Uh, you know, we've we've done this timid first step. Maybe we'll do some dunes over here. What do you think? You know. Uh, maybe we should be, because the beach is the only right. reason Santa Monica exists, really, we should right. be a little more experimental and a little more proactive to start. I think it'll be a, a very big discussion over the next and couple of decades. I think that it, it will be a very important discussion. That the city will right, have. but for example, if someone came to you and said, you know, if we raised that bike path three feet, mm -hmm. it would really protect the properties behind it. Where, where would that discussion occur? And then someone says, oh, no, five feet is what you need minimum, or well, it, it won't make a difference. You're going to be overrun anyway by the first I little the tsunami. First, I think the first place the discussion will occur will probably be in the implementation plan after the land use plan. Like once these policies have been certified and now we're looking at how they get implemented. So the coastal zoning ordinance is a big part of the implementation plan, but the implementation plan could include other things. It could include an adaptation plan that would look at things like that. It could include things like the in-lieu fees and you know the, mm -hmm. the for low-cost uh, accommodation. So there are other aspects right. of the implementation plan, and that's where a lot of the coastal discussion. And happen. does the implementation plan have to be approved by the city, yeah. uh, by the coastal commission, or same just same process as this? First the exact adoption same by process. the city, then certification I by see. the coastal Good. commission. Uh, last yeah. question. Um, do I understand it to you to say that any palm tree or the canary palm or Mexican fan palm that we have in the city today could be replaced at no penalty? Or are we just waiting for them to die and then that's how we're going to get to rid of those invasive species? Um, 
So there's nothing that mandates removal of existing trees, but mm. should the trees be removed because they die or whatever, and they have limited um, life, or because there's you know some kind of development where they remove a tree, uh, they could not be replaced. That species of tree could not be replaced. So um, except for the exceptions of Palisades Park and the City Hall um, landscape. Okay, so we don't. So we just have. Just like we have a, uh, for lack of a better word, a ticking time bomb of sea level rise, we have a ticking time bomb of palm tree die off that, except in the Palisades Park, right. and, 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 and all, the, all right. the palms will disappear except in those areas, in the Al coastal zone. Although there are species of palm trees that are non invasive, and, and those could be planted. So I it's see. just the specific. Do, do they look like the ones that we're. Would you be able to tell them? Up? Oh, no, that's one of those. Would I be able to tell yeah. them? Or I mean, would our city arborist be able to tell them? Right. I'm saying, <laughs> how close can yeah. we get? Yeah. So, you know, there are other species that can be considered. And, you know, we don't know in Palisades Park what decisions will be made in the future when trees um, die and are replaced. They may actually not be replaced in kind if there's a disease issue for sure. those particular sure. kinds of trees. But the option to replace them in kind will be kept open through through this language. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, please. Hi, Mike. Can you address the questions from the speakers? Um, the first question about the oceanfront walk um, scenic corridor, and then also the comments about the yeah. consistencies with, for example, the loose and current zoning. Okay, so um, I mean, you still have the questions, which I'm not sure if you were going to go through the guiding right. questions, but that gets to the one of those questions. We'll get to the question of scenic corridors and whether they're the right ones and whether you want to suggest others. Um, so, um, what was the your other question was about um, consistency with. With the, I was just wondering if you had considered or right. even have enough time considering mm -hmm. she just spoke at the last minute, Ms. Larmore's mm -hmm. comments about the consistency issues. I, I think well, I can address. I, I, I'm, I'm really kind of asking because, yeah. for example, yeah. the staff report says, you know, um, what does it say? Adoption hearings in May and June. I mean, mm -hmm. if, those, if, if it's true that maybe those issues aren't thoroughly addressed, is that a realistic time frame? And, well, yeah, uh, so so the May, I think we, we put that as a target to, to get to, you know, not knowing how many comments we were going to get during this public review period. Obviously, our intent is to revise the document, um, you know, as appropriate in response to public comments. And I think that, you know, um, Carrie and Liz have been on the road shows with um, various boards and commissions with interest in this, and some of them um, are still working to sort of give us, give us our written or give us their written comments, which we will definitely address and um, you know all of that will be transparently done with respect to the comment about consistency with um, existing documents you know that the LUP is not a reopener on land use debates that we've had in this city over the past decade you know it's it's really an update to incorporate things you know like the loose the zoning update the DCP the CCSP um, so to that extent you know the LUP is is consistent all the policies in here reflect existing city policy already, um, including, uh, um, you know, in, in our proposal, including the, um, you know, no minimum parking requirements um, within the downtown. I think, you know, we want to clarify that that doesn't mean that it, no, no minimum parking requirements does not mean require, you know, note that someone is absolutely prohibited from building mm -hmm. parking. As we know, that's not the case, right? It's, we, we don't require it, but there's a maximum. So, of course, you can build some parking, um, you know, so um, that's something that the council was very clear about, um, you know, and not something that, um, you know, we're looking at revisiting um, at this moment, um, you know, but again, we've, we've heard the comments and, you know, we can certainly take them into consideration. And I know that yeah. she brought up the one, you know, the parking issue, which thank you for mm -hmm. commenting on that, but, and I guess, I, I mean, I kind of heard her highlighting that one, but I think her comment was about yeah. them in general and so is staff yeah. comfortable at this point that there's no outstanding issues or um, I, I think the written comments that that we got um, from Ms. Larmore pointed out a couple of um, uh, places you know that they wanted us to look at and we'll of course look at that to make sure that it is you know fully consistent with um, the permitted land uses in the DCP and that you know we didn't accidentally um, you know write something in that is uh, contrary 
uh, right. to what we want to do in the DCP. Okay, and, and, and to that, her concern yeah, about the current situation, mm -hmm. I think we agree that it is a very difficult situation right now that, um, um, and you know, this, this, was, this was the case before the LUP process began that Coastal Commission approvals are sometimes, sometimes difficult. They sometimes have different parking, they use a different parking standard than what we use. Um, and that will not, some of that will not be totally resolved until the implementation plan, I, I think. We try to resolve as much as we could with policy that would be this policy that becomes the standard of review uh, for CDPs while they are being reviewed by the Coastal Commission. Um, but until the implementation plan is certified and there are more specific, there's more specific language that is, is clear about what the parking requirements are and they become consistent within the city instead of those two different things. Some of that will, you know, we're not gonna solve all the problems even if this gets certified, although it will go, you know, it'll go a long way towards becoming a more consistent standard of review, we hope, that the decisions are made at the Coastal Commission. Okay, and the question again, going back to the oceanfront walk question, which you bounced back to me and said, well, I don't know, maybe the commission's going to make some recommendation or something. Mm -hmm. What if the commission did? Like, what are, does staff have thoughts on this at all? I mean, it looks on, like. On the, specifically yeah. on that corridor of Oceanfront Walk? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it was something brought up to us, you know, in the last um, few days and not something that we're not, we haven't analyzed. I see. Um, okay. I, I'm not. But you know, still I could give you my opinion. I'm not sure if that if that matters right now. I think we want to you know hear if the commission wants us to look at that. Um, and then so there still would be time. Obviously, there's still time to. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and can I just ask well before I give up my mic? Um, this isn't our last opportunity to provide input to you on this. Uh, is I heard um, David say earlier that this was on a future agenda. Is that correct? We'll have an opportunity to perhaps. I don't. I feel like I, I'm still reviewing the document. Um, yeah. This, you know, Coastal Commission response I didn't see until now, so we'll have an opportunity to provide and put again. Correct? Yeah. This is. I mean, the, the reason we're doing this is to, um, you know, the documents was released in uh, January and then re-released in February, um, and we're we're giving kind of a good long time okay. for the community to review it, absorb it. Uh, we're having this study session. You know, we kind of use this Planning Commission study session as. We didn't tell people that we must have your comments by X date, but we generally told people we could have it by the end of March. That would be great, you know, I with see. a tentative May 2nd start of um, formal adoption hearings um, for the draft OEP. So the next time we're back here at the Planning Commission, um, it will be the um, adoption hearings where we will have, and, and, and we'll definitely summarize for you any other input that we heard in this public review period, you know, how we analyze the issues that were raised, whether it resulted in changes in the document. Um, so absolutely, you'll, you'll definitely have another chance at this. So if we wanted to continue to provide feedback as a body to you after this evening, we should continue this item? Is that the best way to go or? You can certainly do that. I mean, t tonight is uh, the purpose for you to, you know, ask the questions you can. We've, we've tried to, in the staff report, provide for you, you know, not go like policy by policy, but at least give you the flavor of the general, the approach that informed the way these policies are written, because we know it can be quite dense, yeah. and the context within which um, you know that the staff looked at these, and then these questions were sort of highlighting for you, um, you know, we thought might be interesting for the commission to consider um, as part of your deliberation. I think what we're looking for really is any key direction, anything that you've seen, you know, in in, in the course of reading the staff report and the highlighted policies. Um, that you'd like us to take a look at. So more drilled down, specific, like detailed comments other than broad strokes could come at a subsequent meeting? It, it could, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna hear from Leslie and a few of us have a couple more questions and maybe we should okay. move on to our I just, I have a quick question about the Oceanfront Walk um, properties and Stephanie may know the answer to this or may not, or, or maybe somebody from the property owner's camp. Um, in the STOA for the designation of those properties as landmarks, was there any mention of their relationship to the pier? Any visual relationship being across the way from Carousel Park? You don't know? 
it, it, it talked about the context, the setting, and, and, and what have you. But, um, you know, like Liz said, we got the comments, um, you know, just a short time ago. From what, I, from what I recall of the STOA, I don't think it it specifically mentioned that relationship to the peer. Um, so that's sort yeah, of a key question was, um, yeah. in terms of the, the view shed being proposed. Mm -hmm. View quarter, and I, I mean, I, I think the other thing that we do want to just, just as a, you know, again as a policy approach in the, the scenic corridors and vantage points that um, they really emphasize public views of the coast, um, and you know, you can see that in all, in all of the analyses, um, the non-contributing views, you know, are not across private property or private buildings or what have you. Um, you know, we really looked at protecting views of beach and mm -hmm. ocean and coastline and mountains and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's a, I, I just want to share that as a basic approach, um, you know, in terms of identifying. Well, Oceanfront Walk walkways. is a public walkway. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. do use it. So, I mean, you yeah. can probably justify it on that basis. It, I, I should know this. Is Muscle Beach there or is it farther down the beach? The original Muscle Beach is. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it across there. from um, it, it's, properties? It's across from Chess Park, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, I just had one really quick thing because I want to wrap up the discussion uh, and that is I just realized sitting here and I checked on my phone there are palm trees adjacent to our landmark civic auditorium as well which I'm pretty sure are part of the designation those there's like mm -hmm. two sets of three palm trees on either side so uh, did we just forget about those or did we decide they weren't important or are you planning to demolish the civic anyway? So. <laughs> the answer to the third question is no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was kidding, just for the record. Um, I, I don't think that those were brought up as, as, as significant parts of the landscape. Not that they're not, but we would have to go back and look at the, at the designation and see if they it were was a really long called time as ago, character defining but... features. Yeah. It was a long, it was like 2005. Two. 2002? Two, yes. It was my first meeting, that's why I remember. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we should definitely take a look at that um, and check that STOA, because I have okay. a feeling those are character defining features. So we don't want to forget those. Okay, Jason Perry. Yeah, very briefly, I just want to ask a big picture question. Uh, I, I assume that it's the the Coastal Commission does not ask a particular applicant for all the things that it's asking of to be included within this this document is that is that right like the policies related to a hotel they, they don't they I'm, don't I'm not sure what you're you know it what's this in theory it is the local agency who is drafting the LUP in consultation with the Coastal Commission. That's the way the statute is written. So theoretically, we take the lead and they provide consultation. And so uh, they have provided consultation. How far that goes and whether they uh, certify our LUP or not is, is yet to be seen. However, many of these issues, um, there's still room to work some of these things out. So. The problem is that the statute is not very specific, and some of the things that they are requesting are very specific, but not necessarily uh, required by statute. So and it leaves room for interpretation. And there are things that there are things here that they do not ask of applicants that they haven't asked of applicants in the past. Is that? Uh, so, for instance, the 25% yeah. hotels, and have they tried to ask that in the past? Is that what right. you're... Um, so, we, we um, I don't know about specific applications. We do know that they have proposed putting this into some other um, land, use plan, uh, land use plans for... Which uh, uh, it was San Clemente, San Clemente um, was somewhere on the central coast, or I think it was like Santa Barbara, maybe. Right. And and those are not sort of the those local agencies have have not accepted that that is an appropriate uh, policy as well. Right. Um, I can share that in the last couple of years that we've been working with the coastal staff, it appears to us that they have they, they of course have an interest in trying to make all. LUPs or LCPs consistent. So a lot of the language and suggestions we get from them, we typically hear, well, you know, we proposed it, 
in here or there, you know, and we're we're putting this policy in here because, you know, it's what we did in Carlsbad or what have you. And, you know, our response has been, well, that's nice, but, you know, we're not that city. I mean, we're a little bit different in this, that, and the other. And so that has been really a lot of the crux of the discussions of, you know, yeah. to make, making sure that although, you know, we're going through the certification process, it needs to be, um, you know, ultimately approved um, by the Coastal Commission that we don't lose, um, you know, the Santa Monica flavor in this. I mean, you know, we've spent, you know, centuries, <laughs> right? And, you know, in, in terms of developing the culture, the policy, you know, that, that drives um, local land use decisions and whatnot, you know, in the city. And, you know, that's that, that's a lot of why, um, you know, we are holding firm on, on some of these things. We've certainly um, compromised, you know, and tried to come to agreement on different policies. But, you know, there are things like, you know, short-term vacation rentals where we're like, absolutely not. You know, we just, we have no compromise on that. That is so core to who we are as a city that we just can't depart from that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mario, uh, last question. Two, I last two questions. Okay, last two questions. Uh, first question, um, in this, uh, on page two of the, uh, the response, uh, there's a comment that says that if you are within uh, the first public street or 300 feet of a beach, you still have to go to Long Beach for your coastal permit. Is, is that correct? The area of original jurisdiction. In other words, yeah. this doesn't apply to anything on Ocean Front Walk, anything on Appian Way, uh, where, where those, all that whole strip that is in the danger zone, so to speak, still has to get a coastal yeah. permit and pay right. all those fees and wait for six months Right. to get on the calendar, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. Is that accurate? That's accurate in terms of the process. I mean, in terms of the policies here, the, pol the policies here would um, still apply still to apply, those properties. But if you're if, but a property within the area of original jurisdiction of the Coastal Commission, and that is in the Coastal Act, actually, so that is not something we can talk about with them. That's right. state law. Um, so properties that fall within that area will always need to get a CDB from the Coastal Commission. Okay, uh, and last question. In the debate, and maybe this is a question for the rest of the staff, in the debate in the tension between the city and the Coastal Commission, and we want this and they don't want that, and they go back and forth, uh, is this thing essentially have to be resolved before it goes to the actual commission, the California Coastal Commission, or is this something that gets brought down to where the, the two chess pieces are as close as they can be, and then right. Solomon comes in and makes the decision? Uh, if that's the case, is there anything that we can do as a group or as a city to influence the commission to help you have a stronger bargaining position? So the answer is that the, the latter is the, is the case. In other words, um, the commission makes the decision in the end. The staff, the Coastal Commission staff, are the staff members who work with them most mm -hmm. and have the most you know, influence sure. into their decision making, but they don't have 100% influence into it. The commissioners are the commissioners, as you are the commissioners. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the staff's opinions about what they believe the commission will approve or not approve is you know that's what they're going by so um, they're bringing that to the discussion we're bringing our side to the discussion we've we've have really reached a lot of agreement on oh, it's lot very of impressive the, the amount of agreement that's been reached but and and the reason and, and I didn't say this in the beginning of this discussion although I did talk about it two years ago when we began this um, there is a grant that we received mm -hmm. from the Coastal Commission. Yeah, it's Commission, mentioned in the report. And that is in the Coastal Act as well, that at their, the Coastal Commission is actually supposed to support the, the mm -hmm. cities who do these processes. So that's why there are grants. Um, but part of that grant process was establishing a communications line so that we, so that at this point, when we submit something forward, it's not the first time their staff has looked at it, and there's not going to be a thousand things that we all have to talk about. Hopefully, there will be very few, but there will be those. And in terms of what could the planning commission do um, once we get past that adoption phase and send it to certification, you know, support at the coastal commission is will be important. I think it'll be important for them to hear from the 
you know, people in so, the city, and especially from the most involved people like the Coastal Commission, I mean, sorry, like the Planning Commission. So we should plan on going to Eureka, to basically. We'll have to see. They, they go around the state. We'll right, have to see which right. hearing, they, which location they give us. So, but, um, but yeah, I think local um, testimony of support is going to be important ultimately in the certification process. Thank you. Beautiful. Road trip. Mario's driving. All right. Um, so let's uh, Maybe it'll be in the Civic these... Auditorium. Pardon? They, they have had a hearing in the Civic Auditorium, so who knows? Maybe it'll be that more be convenient. So, um, so uh, we have a bunch of questions from staff that kind of zeroes in on this and organizes us, and uh, they're on page 16 of your staff report. Oh, there they are. Those are them. Uh huh. So those are the first one on access. Do we we don't need do we need to get a consensus or do we just all need to sort of spiel our bits and? Send? I think just you know general. We don't need you to vote or take an action or anything. I think we just put these up there as a way to help guide your discussion. Um, and uh, you know to the extent there's opinions on each, that would be helpful. Okay. So what we should do then is go through. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six areas. Uh, so why don't we go through each one and maybe each person take a turn. We'll go through access and then we'll do, does that sound like it's gonna take forever? No. Okay, let's do it that way. Okay, Mario, access. I'm all good. You're all good. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, no comments at this time on access. Uh, Leslie? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if the implementation program or this is the place to explore the possibility of removing the parking from this pier. I'm not sure where that would be, just as a thought. So as, as Liz had explained, um, policy number, it's 18, 18. right guys? Um, has, it, it provides that flexibility. Okay. And at this point in time, you know, that I don't think that we want to be definitive one way or the other because that's ultimately the council's okay. decision. Cool. Yeah. Um, the other point I have was raised by one of the um, people who testified, and that is that I think that in arguing about our parking policy and potential conflict with the Commission's accessibility issues, uh, two things. One is that the large sites, or whatever they're called now, uh, will no doubt have parking. So I think that if you haven't already discussed that with the Commission, that should be a point of discussion that, you know, we're not talking about no parking downtown. And the other thought is that the, no developer in his or her right, her right mind is going to build a project without parking. So even though we don't have a, a parking requirement, it's inconceivable that parking is not going to be part of projects. And you can probably look at past history of projects that have come through us, even though that standard really hasn't been applied yet, to show that just realistically you're going to put parking, some parking, in a project. Cool. Um, I have nothing to add. I think it's fabulous. Jason? Okay. Uh, so that brings us to recreation. Mario. It's fine. Jennifer. The first question about the general policy approach, providing a diverse range, yes. Regarding the, um, I'm not, it, uh, I'm not sure about the second one just yet, so I'll, wait to comment on that for a future meeting. So, okay, I'm fine with recreation. Jason? Okay. Sea level rise. Mario? I'm, it's best we can do at this time. Okay, Jennifer? Yes, fine with that. Leslie? I'm fine. I'm fine, Jason? Yeah, I'm generally fine with it. Uh, I would, I mean, I guess it, as staff indicated, it's ultimately a, an interesting question for the implementation plan. Uh, what things should we be doing now versus what things should we be holding off until, you know, a, the a water situation. <laughs> right. Um, and, I, you know, my, my leaning is that for a number of reasons we should be on the, uh, uh, on the aggressive side of adding requirements that make the, the, the beach area more resilient. Uh, but like I said, you know, as staff indicated, that seems like that's gonna be a 
uh, an issue for a, a later discussion. Um, I did have one actual comment, and that was my whole concern about Palisades Park falling into the tunnels underneath mm. it. So that's just a little research project. Um, and then that brings us to environmental quality. Mario? Uh, I really like the city's uh, water storage and rain stormwater retention practices, and I think we should continue those. Jennifer? Agreed. Me too. Me too. I feel pretty proud of us, actually, in that area. Um, okay, then we get to scenic and visual resources. Mario? Uh, I think these scenic corridors are a good long-term strategy to maintain certain, let's say, intangible benefits for the city, direct vax views of the ocean, uh, I'll use an example. When you drive up PCH in Malibu, you can drive for a mile and never see the ocean because there's, mm -hmm. you know, houses everywhere, and we're we're not in that position. I'm glad we aren't. We so can, you like the scenic corridors, yes. right? <laughs> Jennifer, um, in this area, I kind of feel like we're not being inclusive enough. Uh, just. A, you know, a brief review of the what was available in uh, 1992 and what is being proposed now to me kind of seems like uh, we should be doing more to preserve more views. Um, so well, the ones that I see now are good, but I'd like to actually reserve my comment and uh, for a, a future meeting and I might do some individual research to go out and check because, for example, San Vicente, I want to look at oceanfront walk more closely, personally. Um, so some of the areas, and I understand what um, staff was talking about earlier about we're not talking about looking through private property and whatnot, but um, again, I pr want to do a little hands-on uh, research and, and I generally feel that we should be more inclusive rather than excluding some of these views. Uh, and then we have, oh yeah, then um, and, and I, I um, support Commissioner Kennedy's uh, notion of looking further or more deeply at Oceanfront Walk as a, as a view corridor um, for lots of reasons. I mean, I, I know that we're butting up against another city agenda here, um, but from the standpoint of Carousel Park and the properties and the walkway along um, the landmark properties, I think that needs to be looked at more closely. Um, and and I'm, I'm kind of, it's, this is going to be interesting when it actually plays out. I mean, we have... Uh, development standards for downtown, and they are what they are. So how that interplays with scenic corridors, I guess we'll see on a project-by-project -project basis. But, you know, we're also theoretically supportive of transit-oriented development, so how does that interplay with scenic corridors? And I guess that'll have to happen on a project-by-project -project basis, but it's, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, and, and again, you know, we were quite um, uh, careful to focus on public, you know, views, uh, public views from public corridors on public right away. So. Again, you know, we've we've never, as a city, had like a private view preservation ordinance or across right. private property. Right. So, sure. you know, we don't we don't believe that there would be conflict in that regard. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I, I agree, including the the comments regarding Oceanfront Walk. Um, I also support that, and of course, I have a whole new ball of wax to throw at you. <laughs> Which is, um, I think that as a scenic corridor, we should really think about the view from the uh, the California Coastal Trail, or what we commonly call the bike path. Um, I really think that what makes our beach really spectacular and gorgeous is not just the view of the ocean, but the view of the bluff. And I think that defining that view from just PCH you, you barely can see the bluff from there. It's just right in front of you. But from the bike path, that's where you really get the juice. So I would really like to see that considered a scenic corridor as well. Um, I think that, you know, I found uh, last time when we looked at this, uh, I was thinking a lot, as you may recall, I made you all a little book booklet with some ideas, which staff lovingly researched and had comments for. Um, but I came across a white paper from the, uh, this is not the right page here. 
um, from the uh, from a, that was a it was a memo to the Coastal Commission that talked about basically those kinds of reverse views and other features adjacent to the coast that are also really important and uh, so I think that's especially important I also uh, wanted to note I sent you a couple of articles about the plantings on the bluff because uh, those the bluff was first planted like deliberately uh, after when they built the Roosevelt Highway in 1935 it was all part of the big PWA overhaul of that whole front edge of our city they did a ton of work here the PWA guys from the state of California loved Santa Monica WPA. the same as the WPA WPA you, you're, you mean WPA no it was PWA and why was that is before it? Roosevelt it was early it was PWA and then it was Sarah WPA <laughs> came later oh my god now you should, I should uh, trust should me never question I know this yeah. this never much I know <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I can give you footnotes later um, <laughs> but uh, so it's a really important planting the article list there are many articles that talk about the different plants it was a big deal everyone was really excited they voted on a city flower which was bougainvillea and the plantings were really dominated by bougainvillea and eucalyptus trees and then there were other things that were mixed in with that that I think are probably less important but today when you go by there the view is really dominated by those two kinds of plants so I think that's really part of the character of our particular place even though it's not a landmark so uh, I think that's really important um, I was very happy to see that the Main Street Bridge was added as a view corridor and I had originally asked that also the 4th Street Bridge because that whole idea of the gully even though it is really altered it's still the remains of a natural <laughs> landform so I would like to uh, keep that on the list and not throw that one away quite yet um, I'll give up the one on the driveway by the lobster because it's private pop property and I'll accept that but that I thought was an important view because there has been a restaurant in that spot since 1877 where the lobster is there's always been a seafood restaurant in that spot except for a very short window and um, and that place where the driveway is is actually where the original uh, Los Angeles and Independence Railroad went down to the beach so for nerds among us being able to look down that little path is a small thrill um, I would also I really support the idea of the view corridor on the oceanfront walk as well as my fellow commissioners are interested in that um, I think that uh, in addition to the natural resources we have there are a lot of not just landmarks but cultural resources and just traditionally really fun places like hot dog on a stick for example just you know just a lot of things that when you look down that corridor they say beach fun recreation this is our place to be and I think that the views down that and capturing all that as an eyeful is a really important part of the experience so I'm really into view corridors I would second everything that you've said regarding view Thank corridors. you. I'll third it. In fact, I want to say thank you very much for bringing up the comment, your comment about the bike path, because I was wondering the same thing, but actually just sort of took it for granted, the views of the bluffs and those things that you said about the bluffs. So um, pointing it out and putting it on the record, I think, is important. Thanks for doing that. Sure. So uh, cool. So that brings us to cultural resources and historic preservation Mario um, all good Jennifer uh, based on my the view review I've done so far yes but um, I look forward to hearing your comments <laughs> I'm sure you will I don't have a single one Go ahead. Actually, I'm, uh, this is fine, and I think I mean we have substantial backup from um, the landmarks ordinance and from the DCP and what have you. So this is fine, and very good job, Liz. I forgot to say that. 
mm -hmm. and all of your staff. Yes. Um, I, of course, had a few tiny little notes. Um, well, two of them were just text notes, you know, corrections about certain dates and uh, uh, so forth. And I pointed out in the descriptive section before the policies that the shotgun house is, of course, a very significant public visitor resource on Main Street. So um, I also, uh, uh, Ruth Ann Lear came and gave, made some comments uh, about the, you know, noting also, this is just a descriptive thing about the carousel being a natural national register thing, the carousel park. You know, I think that's part of the view corridor, really, the carousel park. Uh, listing landmarks would be really helpful. And then she said something about la adding landmarks to the cultural resources of policy 161, which, of course, I haven't read that way, but I would just ask that we all look at that for next time, or staff just put that on the list to check out. What you just said. Aren't, the, aren't all the historic resources downtown listed in the DCP? Why would we do that again? Because this is a different document. You know, they, they could go in. It um, might be a helpful reference. It, w it won't really change um, no, I understand. Just the protections like more, more of the paper LEP, and more work. but, you know, yeah. Okay. Um, and... Uh, one last teeny little thing, which is really tiny, but I just have to say it because I can't resist, is that the dune restoration on North Beach is, of course, not a restoration because there were never dunes there. It was originally a really shallow, flat area. The dunes were on South Beach. So it's a dune creation, a dune project. I just, you know, I don't like to mislead because people take words and run with them and suddenly we had dunes on North Beach and, you know. Um, I think those are all. I want one final comment. Uh, wait, I haven't made my final comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Which is that even though I just said a lot of things, actually overall I think this is a great document and I only found one typo and it was amazing. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I just have one um, issue that was raised, and that is the, this is going to sound weird, the birds under the pier. <laughs> I'm kind of concerned about those pier birds. Um, you, you said, <laughs> you said mitigation. I hope mitigation doesn't equate to annihilation. Uh, <laughs> I think the goal is to encourage them to live elsewhere, but not to actually destroy them. Under. Maybe but you could move them into Sunset Park. I have a park across the street. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, I mean, you're really not seriously considering eliminating them, are you? No, I think you know part of the problem is, um, and they've tried. There, there have been a bunch of uh, experiments that were done. In fact, there was one where I believe there was some netting that was put in, and while the netting mm -hmm. remained in place, the birds couldn't get down there, and it got a lot better, and the water quality improved. But then, um, then there was damage to the netting, and I understand it was human damage not bird damage that was done to the netting but then the birds got back in so you know it's back to the drawing board so this is just one of those uh, you know um, full employment acts for public works I guess so. <laughs> beautiful are there any more final comments or are we ready to uh, cruise I think that uh, concludes our study session. Nice work, everybody. Very, good. very nice. So uh, we don't have any written communications. We have one future agenda item, which uh, we talked about earlier about the mission statement, right? And uh, we don't have any public input. Does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Beautiful.